Welcome back to Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scher. Today, we're going to see a compilation of three interviews, each with a dramatic story of illness and recovery from anorexia nervosa. We'll hear about the, the serious and potentially catastrophic psychological and physical health issues that accompany anorexia. We'll hear about the difficulty of gaining insight, the, the shortcomings of conventional treatment, but also how each of these individuals was told they would struggle with their eating disorder forever without the ability for recovery. But fortunately for all three of them, but by going outside of conventional treatment, they were, they were all able to achieve remission. And one common theme among them was the use of nutritional ketosis to help heal and, and put their anorexia into remission. Now, ketosis wasn't the only treatment they used, as other aspects of their lives needed to be addressed, as is often the case with psychiatric illnesses. But still, for each of them, therapeutic nutritional ketosis was the cornerstone of their therapy. Now, this doesn't mean everybody with an eating disorder should try ketosis. Still, these individual stories, though, can, can give hope to many individuals living with eating disorders and struggling to find an effective treatment. We hope this information will encourage them to discuss nutritional changes with their provider and, and seek out experienced clinicians to help, help them heal. So if you're looking for more information, though, on nutritional ketosis as a potential treatment for anorexia, please see our additional videos on this topic on our Metabolic Mind YouTube page and our podcast. But before we get on with the interviews, please remember our channel is for informational purposes only. We're not providing individual or group medical or healthcare advice or establishing a provider-patient relationship. Many of the interventions we discuss can have dramatic or potentially dangerous effects if done without proper supervision. So always consult with your healthcare provider before changing your lifestyle or medications. Now, one other um, caveat is that nutritional ketosis is not an approved treatment for anorexia. And it's been studied, but in a very controlled environment with frequent safety checks. Uh, so please do not try to use nutritional ketosis on your own for anorexia. If you're considering it, consult with your healthcare provider first. Okay, so with that as the intro, now let's get on with the, these compilation of these three interviews that are really pretty inspiring and, and I find very dramatic and, and hopefully something that people can learn from. So Amelia, I want to start off by thanking you for being brave enough and courageous enough to, to share your story and your journey. But I want and I want to start by asking you, why did you want to share this? I mean, it, some of this sounds like really sort of painful and traumatic for you to go through. So I'm curious why you wanted to share this with the world. The reason that I want to share my story and help others is because it was such a dark period. I struggled on and off, mostly on, for almost 30 years. Um, and I did everything that I feel that conventional medicine offers and nothing helped. I shouldn't be alive for what I went through and how low and, and my weight was and how much starvation I was in. But when I have now found the absolute freedom that I've found and how much my brain is working now, I just want to help others. And even professionals sometimes say, well, you can get control of it, but it will never be gone. And I'm here to say that it can be gone, completely gone. You can have complete freedom, healing, remission, you know, however you want to phrase it. Let, let's go back for a, a bit and go back to the time when you were 14, when you were first diagnosed with anorexia, and tell us kind of what you were feeling and what you were going through at that time. I felt unworthy, um, abandoned, neglected, unloved. Um, and at 14, I was starting to have some body image issues. And I, my brain told me that maybe if I lost weight, that he would love me. Mm. And that's where it started. Because of some of the events that happened with my dad, um, I felt very out of control in life in general. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one way that I could feel that I had a sense of control over my life, that I couldn't control how he treated me. I couldn't control the environment I was in with him when he finally did come around. Um, but I could control what I put in my mouth. Yeah. It, it's amazing how the brain can trick you into thinking these things, you know, in a way, or, or you can convince yourself that, oh, this is, this is it. If I can do this, 
everything will change, or if I can control this, everything will change, but it doesn't happen. So you said it, it, it spiraled. So give us an idea of, uh, I mean, sorry to have to relive it, but how low did it get? How problematic was it? At first, it was um, pretty easy to be secretive. You know, I would say I, I ran out of time to eat breakfast in the morning because I've got to do my hair and get to school. Um, and then the next meal to go was lunch. No one in my family knew that, but I was going in the bathroom and sitting in the bathroom with the closed stall during lunch period so I could avoid lunch. But then I would still have dinner with my family, but they didn't know, you know, that I had skipped the other two meals. And then I started having brain issues. I started having mm -hmm. severe auditory voices screaming at me 24 hours a day to not eat. Hmm. And it sounds like you were in and out of treatment for, for many years with many different therapists and medications. And, you know, part of it was, had to be sort of you understanding that there was a problem. And then part of it was your interaction with the treatment. So tell us about how you came to understand there was an issue and then how the treatment sort of either helped or didn't help you along that progress. Okay, the, the first treatment I had was actually inpatient. At 16, um, I was placed in um, a four-week inpatient treatment program um, at a hospital in Ohio in the actual eating disorders unit. And I knew I had a problem. I knew that I was starving on purpose. But at that point, I, I wanted it to be gone, but I wasn't at a place where I wanted to give up what I was doing. I was still actively participating in the starvation and I wanted everyone to leave me alone. What they were serving me in the hospital, looking back on it now, nothing they were serving me to eat or feeding to was anything that was going to help my brain. And then the foods that were consumed that were provided um, in a group setting with the other inpatient girls, it was all pasta, pancakes, cereal. It was all very carb-heavy, sugar-heavy, nothing that was going to restart the brain so that I could think clearly and choose to not mm -hmm. starve myself anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then when you were back out, I guess you could say in the real world, right? You're out of the hospital and you're in the, you're in the system now. So you have follow-up, you have people looking after you. Did you find anything that could, that could help you, that could help quiet the voices, that could help sort of change your perspective on things? I was eating and my weight was higher and I was functioning. I was working full time and um and enjoying being a newlywed and then um continued on and and was functioning but i still with the foods that i was eating i was not eating any protein or any saturated fat i was i was eating pasta and a lot of fruits and vegetables which is what had been pushed on me by the dietitians that it didn't matter what I ate as long as I ate. My thoughts weren't right. I had problems with anxiety and depression. You know, I was married and then my older daughter was born in 97. And at that time, I was caring for my pregnant body the best that I could, but I was compensating in other ways. I, ha I ended up with a condition called trichotillomania where I was hair pulling in order to deal with the foods that I was consuming that I felt out of control, and I was also cutting and doing self-harm. And mm. I, I could not get control of those. I, you know, I would say every day when I got up, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm fine. I'm better. And I'm not going to deal with my feelings or my problems in that way. I'm pregnant. You know, I have a daughter coming into the world. I need to be better than this. And then in 2006, when my younger daughter was three and my older daughter was nine, um, I was having some physical pain 
and I was going to a chiropractor um, and he wanted to rule out whether gluten could be affecting my physical neck pain. Hmm. And instead of me eliminating the, and, and that was a big thing for me because I was living on bagels and pasta and bread yeah. and English muffins and, you know, everything I ate except for the fruits and vegetables was going to have to be cut out in order to see whether this was going to work or not, whether it had any bearing in my physical pain. And instead, and, and if I had had a free functioning grain, what I would have done was take those foods out and put others in. <laughs> well, what wow. I did was I just took those out. But there's a lot of things that, that my family can bring up now about conversations that were had or different activities, and I actually don't remember them. My brain was so badly functioning that I don't remember saying certain things going certain places, it was extremely bad. So then between 2017 and 2018, I began, um, we, we ended up getting better computers and a little mm -hmm. bit better internet because <laughs> we live out in the country and we still had dial up back then. And, um, <laughs> and I was, you know, we, we were able to have what they consider smart TVs that had YouTube. And um, I began to uh, come across people that um, we're talking about how much protein your brain needs. And it was way higher than, than what I had ever thought. My thoughts were better. Um, some of the OCD symptoms were lessening. Some of my anxiety and my depression were lessening. And I was also beginning to um, notice some other changes that as adding protein that pushed out some of the fruits and vegetables I was eating and my irritable bowel syndrome was getting a little mm. better. The very first time I sat down and ate a six ounce steak, it was actually a, a physical experience. I got about halfway done and I actually could feel myself relax. And I'm mm. like, whoa, what, you know, what, what is this? What is going on with my brain and with my body and it was, it was exciting. It was fascinating. Yeah. I think there is enough research. I think there is enough evidence. But I think it gets pushed back upon because of maybe big pharma or, or the way that the food industry, you know, is in hospitals and prisons and schools. Mm -hmm. um, that whole messaging has to be changed. And the food companies that sponsor and provide food for those institutions that is doing a detriment to anyone with any kind of mental illness, not just anorexia or other eating disorders. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and being courageous enough to, to share your journey with us. And I hope others listen and, and learn from it. So thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak. And, uh, you know, I've, I vowed to live the rest of my life being a voice to try to help others because I don't want anyone to ever go through what I went through. I think Amelia's story kind of helps highlight the, the failure of conventional treatment and how experiencing a complete remission is something she was told by many professionals she would never do and was not possible. But now that she has experienced it, she definitely wants to share it. And for that, we're thankful. Now, Trevor, I'd like to hear your story about the background, um, what led to your battle and your journey with anorexia. Um, but one part in particular is with some of our other stories, we hear about um, traumas starting in childhood and the feeling of needing to control something. But your story sounds a little bit different as that, that kind of wasn't the case. So lead us through kind of the buildup of what happened and when you first started noticing you had an issue. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I think from my experience working with other people who have gone through an eating disorder and also my own, I think there's always an element of control. There certainly was for me, but it wasn't sort of the stereotypical storyline that I think we hear in the media. For me, it was really an attempt to better myself. 
around 18 years old, my senior year of high school. Actually, my life was pretty good. It all kind of came crashing down really, really fast for me. And it opened up a bunch of childhood traumas that I didn't realize still Mm -hmm. existed um, that happened years prior. Uh, I moved around a lot as a kid. And so I had just lost my friend group. I was about 14, lost my friend group, had to start over. We moved to Salt Lake City and completely different social environment. That was a trauma that led to the development of anxiety sort of type disorders, like just being anxious and having to call my mom halfway through the school day and her Mm -hmm. checking me out and all all this sort of stuff. For me, it was a little bit about control because I was trying to take back my life. And and so I was like, okay, I'm going to use this opportunity or try to shape it as an opportunity to better myself. So I really got into health and fitness because I thought that was like a good way to focus and not focus on just this breakup I just had with really my first love. So that was like really difficult for me because first love is really hard uh, when that ends. So I started doing that. And at the time I was already, I've always been sort of a pretty slender build guy, but um, subtly I sort of started developing body dysmorphia um, and just body image issues. I would, after this breakup, I started looking at myself in the mirror. I was starting to go to the gym or look, and I just was like, man, I'm not looking like these um, sort of fitness influencer types I'm Mm. seeing online. And I started to do a cut and I didn't even think about weight as a factor in that cut because in my head, there wasn't a connection to cutting Mm. and losing weight. It was just like losing body fat. I was trying to do this whole thing where you gain muscle and burn fat at the same time or whatever because that's like the marketing you hear online Mm. all the time. But what ended up happening is I got perpetually stuck in this cut of eating 800 calories a day, being in an extreme deficit, and working out two to three hours every single day, seven days a week, walking 12 to 15,000 steps on top of wow. being in the gym, doing weights. And the way I did weights is it was sort of, a, uh, sort of like a cardio metabolic weightlifting session where I would exercise with very mm-hmm. limited rest periods. So my heart rate would go up. So I'd still get some cardio benefit. And next thing I know, almost overnight, seemingly to me, I was wow. 88 pounds. 88 pounds. I didn't, I wasn't even the one to realize it. My dad actually caught me getting out of the shower one time and he was like, dude, yeah. he had to take wow. pictures and show me because I just didn't believe how skinny it was. Yeah. And so once your dad sort of brought it to your attention and t- took pictures, did you start to get some insight or did you start to seek treatment at that point? I did. I never was put in a facility and it took me a while because I knew I was in a rough spot. Like I knew there was a problem almost immediately after that, but it took another event to actually make me realize, like, oh, I actually need to start acting on it. I was filming, I was taking digital media courses at the time because that was my major. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had to film a scene outside and I had to jump into camera frame off a one foot ledge. And I remember really distinctly like jumping off that ledge and collapsing under my own weight. Like I couldn't, I didn't have enough muscular strength to Mm. hold myself up from that fall. And that was my wake up call to this is like a huge problem. But then came the conundrum of, okay, I need to gain weight, but I need to do it the right way. And so that, it was really like a slow climb out of that. And I started seeing a therapist, started going to a standard nutritionist. I really was combative with both. Uh, They were very unhelpful at the time. I was also very unwilling to listen. And even after I weight restored, I think actually after I weight restored is when I felt the worst physically. Well, what foods were you, were you eating to weight restore? Um, So I was eating like lots of oatmeal, a lot of like protein powder stuff, a lot of um, drinks. And then actually a personal trainer of mine who I was working with at the time, not physically training, but we'd meet once a week and talk about food and stuff like that. He was the one that actually convinced me to just eat anything to gain weight. And he told me to do yeah. like these crazy 5,000 calorie weekends where I'd eat 5,000 calories like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, almost basically becoming a binge eater. And this is actually where mm-hmm. I became like a binge restrictor because I would basically just eat as much crap as I could on the weekends to gain weight. And this is where I really started experiencing extremely bad mental health and like crazy bad energy swings was when I started mm-hmm. doing this stuff and started to uh, attack my fear foods because my therapist mm. really wanted me to start eating foods that I was afraid of. So like pizza and like 
processed foods and all the stuff. I started incorporating these things back in, which I thought was yeah. like a good thing because I'm fighting my my mentality against them. But I just started feeling like, like physically I felt bad, but like mentally I was just having these crazy, almost bipolar mood swings throughout the day. Mm. And um, this was about a year or two. I weight restored up to like 130. Um, and I was still doing these like crazy, like eating like tons of crap just to like try and mentally get over it. And it seemed like mentally I was getting worse. I was put on two drugs. I was put on Lexapro. Um, but because it takes so many weeks to kick in, they also put me on Clonopin. Yeah. And, and I'm curious how you identified with having an eating disorder because, you know, stereotypically it's young women with eating disorders yep. and, you know, the statistics match it out. Now, clearly not a hundred percent. There are males who get it clearly, but, but definitely a minority. So how did you identify with that? Did you, did you kind of feel differently or did you feel shamed or like, tell us a little bit about that. I felt shameful, but not in not for the reason of being a dude that has it. I quickly realized mm -hmm. that more men have, and statistically, um, me and my friend used to do a podcast about eating disorders because we were both male quote athletes. Uh, he was a he was a footballer, so he actually was an athlete athlete. But we were both athletes that had eating disorders, so we started a podcast about it, started talking about it, stuff like that. And what I realized is like going to the gym, many people had body dysmorphia. It just maybe mm -hmm. didn't manifest as extremely as me. But for me, the shame was in the fact that I let it get this far. I uh, couldn't, okay. I, was, I was very angry with myself that through good intentions, I destroyed my body. And I started identifying not necessarily as an, a person with an eating disorder, but as just a broken person. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned recovery. So give us an idea of your path to recovery through this. Yeah. So the way I've looked at it is I've kind of looked at it in two phases. Um, one of those phases is, is the physical part where you weight restore and you can look in the mirror and, and like feel normal and, and not like, oh man, I'm getting fat or that sort of body dysmorphic thought. That's sort of like mm -hmm. a phase one. And I think I got to that by around 2020, 2019. But what I didn't realize is that there's a whole nother part of recovery that I didn't realize and start of, until I started getting off of sort of the standard American diet or like bodybuilding diets and all that sort of stuff that are like higher carbohydrate and, and still like contain some processed foods and stuff for the sake of calories. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that side is the mental aspect and like the anxieties and like the, I was still having panic attacks after I weight restored, but I would go to the doctor and they'd be like, Oh no, you don't have anorexia anymore. Cause you look normal. And there's mm -hmm. like this whole side to it that um, you can have an eating disorder and be completely normal weight rise. And I think in retrospect, based on my experience now with the way I eat, I think the foods I was eating were perpetuating my anxieties throughout the day because it would happen in succinctness with when I ate. But after I started getting autoimmune issues, and which practically happened overnight, I remember the day it happened. It was July 25th, 2019. Uh, I started getting tingling in my hand, thought it was carpal tunnel. Within a month, it spread to my whole body. I uh, started going to doctors. They had no idea what was going on. Within a couple months, uh, just through my own like fruition, because every doctor was trying to get me to just calm down and say it was in my head, basically. I, I got mm -hmm. a skin punch biopsy in November of 2019, and they confirmed a diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy. Then they did some blood tests and found out that I had an autoimmune component. But it kind of led to a dead end, and that's when I started seeking out I discovered functional medicine and like food is medicine type stuff. And that's when I started okay. like getting a keto mojo and tracking my ketones. And that's when everything really shifted for me it was about 14 months ago. Um, really? I really started getting, I, I thought I was doing good, but I really never realized a calmness like I had. And I got off Lexapro, I got off Clonopin and I have been drug free ever since. My sleep improved. I was able to start sleeping like completely through the night. I didn't wake up to pee in the mm -hmm. middle of the night or anything. I, I, I would, I kind of double taked with myself and I was like, am I just trading eating disorders? Because the way I was treated for anorexia was that all foods fit. I decided that honestly, at the end of the day, it didn't matter because I felt better. Once I started thinking about it logically and thinking about like how the human body is designed, I was like, man, like this actually makes sense for mm -hmm. how we are meant yeah. to be like, 
why why is it normal to eat pizza and cookies and cake just because they exist or why is it normal yeah. to eat these foods that didn't exist in my grandparents grandparents time how right. is it why is that all of a sudden right. normal just because everybody does it and so right. i decided that the real eating disorder was the way i was raised to be a slave to food you really got to look at society as a whole and determine like who's really in charge are you making your decisions for what you deem mm -hmm. to be normal or are you being told what yeah. normal is and is that really right for you, you right. Know? yeah now we mentioned earlier that you felt the shame that you had let it get to such an extreme point um but yet despite having felt that shame here you are being public about it and talking about it and being you know very very brave to do that so what do you hope other people will walk away from by hearing your story and hearing your experience I want other people with eating disorders who suffer from eating disorders, no matter what it is under the umbrella, to know that they can be free of it and not just have to be healthier, but live with the mental consequence of having an eating disorder. Because I was told that it'll always be a part of me. Like I will always have to deal with those fears really? and stuff like that and that I'll never get over it. But I really believe now, especially after speaking to other people who have gone through a similar experience as me now, that you can really be free of those anxieties and not identify with it. And that's why I think the, the second part to recovery is really not identifying with any of those anxieties or labels I think once you get to that, that's when you know you're really past that hurdle. And the only way I look at my eating disorder now is as a way of helping other people by relating to their story and letting them know, like, this is how I got to where I am now. And also just as a way to remember how far I've come. Next, we'll hear the story of Claire. And what Claire's journey shows is the importance of relationships and the importance of insight in, in helping to heal yourself. And, you know, Claire had severe complications and near death experiences actually with cardiorespiratory arrest requiring resuscitation, which is super dramatic, right? It can't get any more dramatic than that. But still, it was difficult for her to gain insight. And it shows a cure isn't just a drug or changing your diet or developing ketosis. But those things have to be done in conjunction with your surroundings and your environment in order for you to allow yourself the space to heal. So let's hear from Claire. If you would, please take us back um, to the point where you realized you were starting to have an issue with food and with your body image and that combination and how it affected your health in the beginning. I have had eating disorders since my childhood. Some traumas during my teenagehood brought me more and more into the eating disorder. It was only a restrictive eating disorder. So I was always uh, counting my food, restricting the food, counting the calories. And it was a way to control my life was controlling my food. Then I got into, into um, marriage, what, which was really... On the one side, my ex-husband was really uh, was the, what we called here a pervert narcissist. And he was putting down and down uh, with food restriction. He was telling me that I was too fat. Even if my, when I met my ex-husband, my, my BMI was around 18. I was fluffy, dixit him. And so he asked me mm. to start exercising as crazy and I started exercising as crazy and I, I lost weight around 10 pounds really quickly. And then I, I wanted to conceive. And so I, I had a lot of trouble being pregnant, of course, because I was re already, already underweight and I was still really under eating. And then I had all this fertility treatment. And of course, it was failure and failure and failure. And then I went through a couple of IVF and one IVF uh, 
time worked and I got pregnant with my son. And I was not really restricting during the pregnancy, but because I was underweight, my pregnancy was just a nightmare. Uh, I finally delivered after uh, at 34 weeks of pregnancy and I lost uh, the twin of my son in the middle of the pregnancy. So I only had one baby. And mm -hmm. then uh, the delivery as well was just a nightmare because I didn't have enough strength to deliver. So finally it was a C-section. And from there, I started breastfeeding my son. And within four days after delivering my son, I was back to my previous weight before pregnancy. From this point, I, I started restricting more and more and I kept breastfeeding my son. And when you're breastfeeding, uh, you're able to, if it's on demand, even if you're not eating enough, you're able to have enough milk. It's what I uh, I learned doing it. I was not eating enough, but I had a lot of milk. I had a huge milk supply and my son was taking all my nutrients and everything. And I lost a lot mm. of weight. Uh, when I stopped breastfeeding him, uh, it was the point I started being around a, a BMI around 12, something like this. In 2015, they started to put um, tube feeding. Wow. into my nose well let, let me let me hold hold you there for a second because there, there's well you've had such a journey already and i want to we'll pick up at 2015 but i'm curious when you were going through the in vitro and and the pregnancy counseling did anybody address what you were eating or give you any advice on how to improve your eating for fertility okay the, the thing is that at this time uh i was not living in france in france it would not have been possible to go through the IVF process with the weight I was, but at this time I was living in the UAE and in the UAE, as long as you're paying, you get whatever you want. So someone, someone who doesn't really understand eating disorders or hasn't been in that position would say, this is wild. You almost lose your child. You could, you could hardly get pregnant in the first place. You, you can't walk because you're so weak. You end up in the hospital with pneumonia. Why didn't you just change what you ate? Like someone could, someone could say that, right? Someone could think that if they're unfamiliar with it. How would, how would you talk to somebody about that who's kind of unfamiliar with this concept? I always thought, all the time I was sick, I always thought I was controlling something. Controlling my food was the way to control my life. And I was even, okay, I had a really uh, depressive behavior. And I was really sure that I was controlling my life and I was controlling the time I would die. In 2017, I got my second pneumonia, my second flu, and I died for six minutes. Uh, and then they resuscitated me. And at this time, I realized, and it was the first time my entire life, I realized that I was not controlling the time I would die. And this was yeah. huge for me. It changed totally the way I was looking at life, you know. I, so I decided that I wanted to leave, uh, but I was so scared. After this episode, for the first three months, I reintroduced the food I was eating um, I stopped being a vegan. I was in reintroducing a little bit of eggs, uh, lean meat, and I really wanted to to, to leave. And my ex-husband, at this time I was still married, uh, I gained three kilos, seven pounds. And <laughs> he was telling me, how many kilos are you going to take? Is it going to continue? Are you going to gain more and more and more and more when this will be stopping? And so I say, oh, okay, I need to please him and I need to show him that I can start restricting again and I, I can stop the gain weight. So I started restricting again. In July 2018, one, one of my blood work showed that I was having a liver failure. Because when you're totally mm. nourished, uh, I had the, my gammas were exploding, my transaminase was expl were exploding, and I had a total liver failure. The doctor say you have to go to the hospital right now, right now, otherwise you will die. And at this time, I um, I asked my parents to take to take my custody, and to take the responsibilities and to decide in my behavior because I knew that I was that weak that I would. I've not taken the good decision. Uh, 
And I, I required in my place in where I'm living uh, to be sent to a specialized uh, eating disorder unit that is close to my parents' place. And I was sent in the center for six weeks. You being sick in the hospital, your son being with your parents, his dad being away and not close to you, enjoying his holidays. And I started realizing that what he was doing to me was not good. And But by September 2018, I went back to my place, living with my ex-husband. And he said the same. After this six weeks, you gain weight. And where when is this going to stop? And I started restricting for months and my psychiatrist told me like, okay, now he's going to kill you. So you have to do something. I took my son, I left the place and I lost almost everything, but uh, I wanted to leave. And so I didn't want to die. And after six months, I was officially divorced. And from this point, you know, living alone with my son, because I got at this time the full custody of my son, I, I really wanted to have enough energy and to be living and I, I wanted to have my life back. Right. Uh, but my restrictive behavior were not over. And so I managed to stabilize my, my body weight to have a BMI around 13, 14, but I was not able to heal. Hmm. I was eating enough. I was making sure that every single day I was eating around 1,500 calories, a little bit more every single day. But it was yeah. always only lots of vegetables, lots of lean meat. When you have been sick for 30 years, you know what it is to be sick. You know what it is to be sick, but you don't know what it is to be healthy. And I was totally yeah. scared and freaking out about what would be my life if I was healthy. What was the next step for you, though? How did you make that jump from where you were at that point to fully healing and, and recovering? I started going back to work. So it gave me just a little bit of confidence. And during this winter, I was always freezing cold because I was too skinny, very, very skinny. So I was still freezing cold. And you know, when you're, you're, you're cold, you can put like, um, you heat some stuff in the micro microwave and then you put on your legs to put it warm. And I was that mm -hmm. cold that I ended burning myself third degree. Oh, wow. So, and, and then I, I was, I was thinking, I was living, I was surviving and it was not that bad and my blood work was better and everything, but I, it was not life. And I started looking for uh, some kind of diet who could help with uh, eating disorder, with mental health. And I found about uh, a lot of uh, information about depressive uh, behavior healed by ketogenic diet. And so at this time, I was looking for this. And I, I looked at Georgia Ede studies. I looked at Amber O'Hearn. And, and I learned a lot. And I wanted to try the ketogenic diet, but it was all about counting macros. And I wanted just to stop counting something I didn't want to go from counting calories to count macros. And then I, I found out about carnivore and I tried carnivore for three months, but my carnivore, the one that was not freaking me out, so lean meat, very lean meat and zero fat yogurt. Mm. And I got uh, an appointment with a coach in Rivero and she was, she said to me, okay, Claire, you have the solution. If today you have a flu, you go to see a doctor and he say to you, okay, uh, take a pill and you're healthy tomorrow. If you take half of the pill, you will be healthy in a week. If you take a quarter of the pill, you will be healthy in a quarter of, uh, in a month. How much pill do you take? And I say, I want to be healthy. I want to get rid of the flu. So I take the full pill. And she says, so jump to carnivore, real carnivore, high fat carnivore. Start eating as crazy. You have nothing to lose. Just try it. As soon as I started, and you know, my body was that weak. I was thinking that it won't be able to handle the fat. I was eating so much fat and so much meat. I was eating mainly ground beef, butter, and yolks. Mainly these mm. only things really are easy to digest. And I couldn't stop. I was eating. I was feeling so great. My body, I, I, I describe it like as body happiness. I was looking at my body changing and I was really, really scared. And I was taking picture every month. And each time I was taking a picture, I was like, oh, you're so fat. And then when I was looking the months mm -hmm. after to the previous months, I was like, oh, you were so skinny at this time. And now you're so fat. So the body dysmorphia continued, even though you were, you were feeling better and yes. eating better. 
Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, I had a very fast weight gain and then it stabilized. And now I'm in like g still gaining some, but for, uh, I would say a year, a year and a half, I almost, I, I gained six pounds. So very slowly compared to 20 pounds in three months. And still mm -hmm. now, body dysmorphia is still ongoing, you know. I'm speaking mm -hmm. to you right now, and if you look at myself, you're thinking that I'm not a fatty girl. But um, uh, if I'm looking at my legs, I'm I'm still feeling like my legs are really, really fat. But hmm. I'm not able to restrict anymore. This is okay. something I cannot do. Yeah. Now, you said before that um, anorexia and eating disorder is a disease of hiding, and you're not going to hide anymore. So tell me more about what you hope your experience and talking about your experience will, will bring to others or, or help others. I want to show that there is a solution. I want to say that uh, eating a carnivore diet, some people are saying you went from a eating disorder to another one because it's a restrictive diet. And what I want, the word I want to spread is this is not true. I got food freedom when I switched to carnivore. And, you know, when you have been thinking about food 23 hours per day for your entire life, being carnivore, nourishing your body, when I'm hungry, I'm eating. And that's why I really want to see that even if for some people it looks restrictive, it's, restrictive is not, it's not the term because it's freedom. I'm free of. And so, something that is very, very important for me to share and to, to, to say is that Family, relatives cannot force you to heal. The person has to decide on his own. Even the, the, the doctors with all their, their diet plans and everything, if you don't decide to heal, you won't heal. You have to decide. You have to take the step for, for yourself. No, no one can convince you. So as you heard from Claire, you have to take the step for yourself, at least the initial step. And, and you also need insight, which can be really difficult to achieve, as you heard from her story. But but once she started eating meat and natural fats, it, it's amazing how she instantly felt better. It was so dramatic in her case. Now, it may not be that dramatic in every case, but, but just the potential in the healing that happened in Claire is so dramatic that I love to hear that story. We applaud these individuals for sharing their story and being brave enough to be public about their journey. And we hope it helps the readers add a little personal context to what they're reading in the published case series.